Send your scariest workplace stories to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. And rate and review Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thanks. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? There are certain places you should never step foot into. The most haunted forest in the world. A dark, lonely street when a serial killer is on the loose. The bathroom after I've been in there too long. You get the picture. Leave some places well enough alone, and you might just live a long and happy life. But what do I know? I'm just some manager at some middle-of-nowhere coffee shop that is visited by more possums than people. Oh well, speaking of places you shouldn't go, how about the places in the stories I have for you today? Stories about the most terrifying forest in the world, and the most disturbing man to ever exist, and more. Enjoy, my friends. These are Tales from the Break Room. Aoki Gahara Vlog From Nature's Trail I'm a decently popular nature vlogger. I'd been debating doing a video on Aoki Gahara, or Suicide Forest, in Japan for some time. I mainly wanted to showcase the forest's natural beauty, while also respectfully delving into its tragic history. After months of research and preparation, I finally booked a flight to Japan. The trip there from SoCal was lengthy, but uneventful. Now, given Aokigahara's reputation as a frequent site for suicides, accessing the area involves caution. It was heavily recommended to me that I hire an authorized local guide to escort me, at least some of the way. The guide I met up with was named Hiro. He was very kind, yet frank about what to expect when we met at the trailhead. He warned me it was not unlikely I would stumble upon human remains, stressing that I must not disturb them if I do, that I should not stray too far from the marked paths. Eventually, I did ask Hiro along our walk about any eerie legends or folklore surrounding the Sea of Trees. His eyes darkened, and he told me something that I have yet to find on the internet, so I'm not sure if it's something he made up to scare me, or if it's a local superstition. Initially when I asked, he gazed off into the forest for a moment, his eyes sort of glazing over as he thought. After a long moment, he turned and invited me to sit beside him on a nearby fallen tree. You ask about legends, Hiro began slowly. There are many dark tales rooted in this sad place, but none more chilling than the legend of the vengeful monk, past whispering around campfires on dark nights. He absently stirred the soil with a stick he'd picked up, conjuring recollections of the tale. It is said that long ago, during a time of war, a young Buddhist monk apprentice struggled greatly with emotions of anger regarding the violence in the world. Over time, his bitterness and wrath grew, poisoning his soul. Finally, the monk abandoned his brothers and retreated into Aokigahara to commit ritual suicide, hoping to purge his hatred through an honorable death. Hito's expression seemed distant, Yet, as the monk sank towards his final breath alone on the cold forest floor, overcome by pain and regret, all that fury and resentment festering within his heart summoned something. Something ancient. Something that fed eagerly on his dark emotions as life ebbed away from him. My guide slowly turned to meet my gaze, his solemn face etched with warning. Now it is whispered that the monk's tormented spirit still haunts this lightless realm between the trees, consumed by a malevolent force granting it terrifying power. Both demon and victim, 
The vengeful monk prays eternally upon those despairing souls who walk all Kikahara's shadowy paths, seeking their own end. I gazed uneasily into the woods surrounding us as Hiro finished speaking. The shadows seemed to lengthen as sunlight dimmed overhead. Then you, uh, you really believe that legend could be true? I asked, finally. Hiro simply bowed his head in a quick prayer and handed me a map silently. After a brief farewell, he turned and melted into the brooding forest without even a backward glance, leaving me suddenly wishing I had not come to Aokigahara alone. Wandering the dusty wooded trails as afternoon shifted to dusk, I was captivated. Shafts of golden light filtered through vibrant emerald canopies. Twisted tree roots breached the forest floor like ancient serpents. Serene ponds mirrored the heavenly blue sky above, between breaks in the tree line. Inside this sea of trees flourished a profound near-holy stillness. The best way I could describe my feeling there was odd. Wandering around, where untold numbers of doomed souls had once tread in their final desperate moments. That thought nagged at me, no matter where I went or how beautiful the scenery was. As the shadows grew, I set up my tent beside a small gurgling brook, figuring the ambient noise would make a soothing lullaby. I cooked a small and contained fire, cooking up some rice and mushrooms for a humble supper. I then snuggled into my sleeping bag inside my tent. Surrounded by the profound silence of the forest, interrupted only barely by the nearby brook, I quickly drifted to sleep, that odd feeling still nagging at me. I jolted awake a few hours later in sheer darkness. For a moment, I was confused. I didn't hear anything at first and I wasn't sure why I woke up so suddenly and randomly. I quietly raised up, hugging my knees, and I listened closely to the nearby murmuring brook, keeping an ear out for any strange noises. I heard leaves rustling, sticks cracking, nighttime bugs. Suddenly, I heard a tremendous whap against the nylon tent wall near my feet. I gasped, stunned by the abrupt loud impact that came out of nowhere and yet was so close. My entire body trembled as I sat frozen now, terrified. Dead silence followed for several minutes. I stayed still except for my eyes, which I used to constantly scan back and forth for any movement in the dark around me. What could be out there that hit my tent? A clumsy bear? Couldn't be. There were no footsteps afterwards. The night was warm, but I felt very, very cold in that moment. Surely there was some rational explanation for this. But still, the loud smack lingered in my memory. Time crawled by slowly as I thought and waited. And eventually, over time, I convinced myself it was some sort of large nighttime flying insect awkwardly blundering into my tent, then careening away to elsewhere. That must be it, I thought. What else could it be? With the tense mystery resolved in my mind, I felt relieved. I loosened up, suddenly feeling tired again, and I went back to sleep, hugging my flashlight like a talisman. At sunrise, I roused, stiff and groggy. The first thing on my mind was that weird noise the night before, but I reminded myself it was just some nocturnal bug or bird. Nothing to worry about. Plus, with the morning birds cheerfully singing around me, I couldn't help but feel foolish for being afraid of that noise at all. So I made some coffee, studied my trail map for a while, then continued working northwest through the maze of crisscrossing footpaths, I was hoping to reach the rocky Narusawa Ice Cave before meeting Hiro that afternoon. I passed rows upon rows of moss-covered trees as I went north, 
pausing frequently to admire the towering pine trees and filming some footage. It was amazing how a beautiful place like this had become somewhere so haunted and tragic. Eventually, I navigated a section of trail that was very densely choked by thorny underbrush. As I painfully made my way through it, I came out and stumbled onto a small wooden shrine nearly concealed by vines. These stone fox-like statues with eerily human-like eyes flanked the weathered altar. There, a lone moth-eaten doll was slumped over next to a cracked incense bowl, some sort of long-abandoned holy site. It was a cool find, but also quite chilling. I said some apologies under my breath for any nearby spirits I may have intruded upon and left quickly. Strangely, as I left that place, a feeling of being watched began to follow me. Shortly afterwards, I struggled to find the trail I'd just been on. Confused, I referenced my GPS, but I could not reconcile my surroundings with what the GPS showed. Had I walked further than I thought, as I struggled to get my bearings, the temperature was plummeting. I shuddered, suddenly realizing the sounds of birds and other animals had died down. Even the wind had ceased, leaving the only remaining sound my startled breathing. When and why did the forest go so silent? A chill ran up my spine. I had to get moving fast, but where? Which way? Eventually, I managed to find my way back to a recognizable trail, but I'd lost quite a bit of time doing so, and I would not be able to make it to Narusawa. Instead, I made my way back to my campsite. All the while, I felt watched, and a new sensation came with it, a feeling of being followed. In fact, I kept hearing twigs snap and leaves rustling behind me. I swear there were footsteps following me, but the moment I would turn around to see if someone was there, the sounds would stop. I never caught sight of my pursuer, if there was one, but the uncanny feeling of stalking eyes stuck to me. Growing more uneasy by the second, I sped up my pace before eventually coming back to my familiar campsite. There, I distractedly prepared some ramen noodles, trying to shrug off creeping dread. I swear, nighttime came much faster than the day before. I retreated into my tent, hoping to review footage to distract myself. I was too anxious to sleep. When I was done with that, I scribbled some field notes and watched stars dance outside my nylon cocoon until exhaustion finally hit me. I was startled awake again a few hours later. This time I knew what it was that woke me, because I heard it. Another whap against my tent wall. My eyes flew wide open. Not again, I thought to myself. Adrenaline flowed through me as I prayed silently for whatever bird or bug or falling branch to remain quiet so that my mind could be put at ease that whatever it was was natural. But as I lay there, tensely waiting for any follow-up or lack thereof, the forest seemed to hold its breath. Though it was silent again, the fact that this had happened two nights in a row around the same time began to make me paranoid. I began to wonder that maybe it wasn't natural. And maybe, just maybe, this had something to do with the feeling of being watched and the following footsteps I'd heard throughout the day. It was like someone wanted me to know that I was not alone. My heart was practically drumming in my ears. Slowly, I crept on all fours through the darkness towards the closed tent flap. I gripped my flashlight like a baton now instead of a talisman. I hesitated, swallowed hard, then slowly unzipped the opening a few cautious inches, just enough for me to peer out of without making it seem obvious. I decided against turning on the flashlight. I did not want any intruders knowing that I was awake. I leaned forward and scanned the surroundings 
the stars and moonlight giving me just enough light to see them. Outside my tent, there were hundreds of figures, figures for as far as I could see through the dark woods. Men, women, even a couple of short figures that must have been children, all of them nude, pale like they were dead. Each one stood completely motionless and quiet, their heads down. Their necks were craned so far forward, I couldn't see if their eyes were open or shut. Maybe it was the darkness. I don't know. The figures that had hair, their hair was dirty and gnarled. There were just so many of them. I had never been so horrified in my life. A scream tried to rise out of my throat, but I silently slapped my hands over my mouth to make sure not a sound came out. If these figures heard me, ugh, the idea of all their heads snapping towards me at once, I would die just from the fear alone. But for now, they did not acknowledge my presence. But I felt if I looked much longer, something might happen. Trembling, I pulled back and re-zipped the flap. I buried myself in my sleeping bag, breathing rapidly but shallow, trying my best to remain as quiet as possible. I didn't move at all until sunrise finally came through my shelter, gleaming through the small opening in my sleeping bag. Once I felt safe, I'd never moved so quickly. I packed up everything, still shaking like a leaf. I fled Aokikahara, still feeling watched and followed. I felt as if I had done something wrong. Why would so many spirits visit me that way? I had done something to disrespect them, I was sure of it. And I had to leave. Perhaps it was the fact I'd come to film here. Maybe the spirits thought I was trying to exploit them for views. I have no idea. I was able to find my way out of the sea of trees, and I called Hiro on my phone, letting him know that I would no longer need his services. I spent the remainder of my day before my flight later in Tokyo, where it was bright and loud and cheerful. But I don't think it helped. On the plane ride back to SoCal, I was able to sleep, but it was fitful, and I think I freaked out the guy next to me. Who knows what I was saying in my sleep. My warning from this story would have to be this. So many people have existed in our world. A lot of the places we tread may be the places where people died. So it's best to tread lightly. To be respectful, just in case. Don't be a Logan Paul going to Aokigahara for some views and clicks. Because the dead simply want to rest. And so did I after that long, excruciating trip. The Man Who Lost a Bet From Pro Dancer I currently work at a dance store as a point shoe fitter for ballet dancers. I got this job to help fund my way through a PhD program and because the hours fit around my lecture and teaching times. However, since I work most often in the evenings, sometimes we get odd customers. Disgruntled people that just got off work and have to spend more money on their kids' dance gear. And Karens. One evening, however, was worse than the others. My assistant manager and I were alone at the store. Note, she's younger than me by a couple of years. A man came in with an, at first, seemingly innocuous request. He had lost a bet from betting on college football and he needed a funny ballet costume for a pole dancing class that he was going to be, quote-unquote, forced to take as a result of losing said bet. While I overheard the initial conversation between him and my assistant manager, I didn't really think much of it, other than, huh, that's a little weird. But that would soon change. My assistant manager came into the back room, where I was taking stock of our available point shoes for future fittings. She said she was very uncomfortable with this man, asking me if I would help him instead. Since I'm not only a little older, but at least a head taller than her, 
I decided to oblige, since I could tell she was genuinely uncomfortable. I emerged from the back, asking how I could help the man. To which he began to retell the entire story back to me. I didn't really want to help him since this is a store for serious dancers, most of which are young girls that wear leotards and tights, not older, overweight men with beer bellies. Since I just wanted him out of the store as quickly as possible, I pointed him toward the largest, most revealing leotard I could find. Per his request, a short ballet skirt and a pair of pink tights. I thought that would be everything he needed that he would take my recommendation, and that would be it. But I was very, very wrong. He practically dragged me around the store, asking if I could find him an even more revealing outfit, and if it would be skimpy enough. He insisted on red, despite the fact we didn't have a red leotard in his size, because, in his words, it would show the outline of his junk better in class. At that point, I'd had enough. I told him that if he wanted the clothes, he could have them, but I would not be showing him any more options. I really just wanted him out of the store, without having to get the police or security involved. Rather than immediately paying for the clothes and leaving, he insisted that he had to try on the leotard to ensure it would fit. I sighed and showed him to a dressing room, hoping that he would just try them on, pay, and leave. If the owner of the store would have been there, I would have asked him to deal with it. But, since it was just me and the assistant manager, I did not want to provoke this man. After all, he seemed a bit unstable. After showing him to the dressing room and closing the curtain, he tried on the clothes but instead of just verifying that they fit and taking them off to purchase them, he came out of the dressing room, proceeding to show us how he looked in the leotard and skirt. Then he repeatedly asked us if we thought he looked good. During this, he seemingly intentionally kept raising the skirt to show us the underside of the leotard. It was at that point I realized this man was not wearing underwear. I could see the outline he referred to earlier. I just kept telling him, yes, it looks fine, urging him to change and get to the register so we could get him out of the store. Once he finally got changed, he handed me the ballet clothes through the curtain, then bolted out of the dressing room, leaving in a hurry. Happy that he was gone, I tossed the clothes behind the counter relieved when I saw him hop into an old sedan and drive off without looking back. I went to the back and looked at my assistant manager in shock, wondering what in the heck both of us had just witnessed. At the time, we almost thought it was a little comical, thinking that there was no need to call the police, that we had handled the situation well. However, after some time had set in, and hindsight cleared away any doubts regarding the situation. We both realized that what we experienced was highly inappropriate, and we may have been in danger due to the unstable and predatory nature of the man. I contemplated calling security or police when it was happening, but I wasn't sure what the man would do when he realized what we were doing. After being on edge the whole interaction, I was just happy that he decided to leave on his own accord, without us having to force him out. However, we're now stuck with the clothes that he tried on and ruined. We still have them on the damaged shelf, because he really stretched them out, leaving tons of glitter on them after trying them on, which we didn't see on him before and have no idea how it got there. And the crotch region of the skirt and leotard carried a very foul odor that neither of us even wanted to try to identify. I'm pretty sure we're just going to burn them both when either of us finally gets approval to do so, from the owner or the general manager. As for the man himself, we never did see him again, and neither of us got a name, phone number, or any identifying info from him other than his general appearance. But we did catch his face on the security cameras, 
and we have a poster on the back of the door stating to other newer employees not to serve him and to call security or police if he does come in. We highly suspect that what was happening was a man with a very specific fetish, and he was using us to act it out, based off the way he was acting, and how quickly he fled the scene once he was finished doing what he needed to do in the dressing room. Long story short, if you're a dance store worker, and a man comes in asking for skimpy dance clothes that show off his nether regions in a pole dancing class, proceed with caution. This guy clearly had no interest in purchasing the clothes, nor actually taking a class or performing. I shudder to think about what might have happened if either of us were alone in that store, because he may have acted even more boldly than he did. Scaredy Cat from Sonora. An acquaintance of mine who happened to have been a cop once told me this little tale he experienced several years ago. Back then, he was a deputy and still new to the patrol scene. Since he was new to it, he got called often to more simple tasks, tasks that made the more experienced deputy's jobs easier. One night, the deputy got a request over his radio to sit on a suicide scene. The victim was still inside the home, and they needed the deputy to sit and guard the main entry to the home until the coroner got there to take the body. They didn't want any relatives or anyone else to enter the scene and mess up evidence. Basically, that was a standard procedure. So the deputy got to the home of the suicide victim and confirmed with the cops already on the scene that he was there to wait for the coroner. It was the middle of the night, so the deputy grabbed his flip phone out of his patrol car and settled on the front porch to play some snake on his phone. All was totally quiet around him after everyone else left. All the deputy could hear were the occasional sounds of distant barking dogs and the faint sounds of the sparse highway traffic. The silence did indeed make him a little nervous, especially considering what lay only a few feet away and invisible to him only because of a wall. So it was only natural that his instincts had his ears on high alert. So, he was startled when he suddenly thought he heard a rustling sound, seemingly coming from inside the house behind him. All he could do was sit there and wait and listen intently. A few minutes went by though, and he didn't hear anything else, so he just figured he probably heard the house settling or something. Over half an hour went by, and the deputy was starting to get a little drowsy staring at Snake on his small flip phone, so he flipped it shut and sat back for a few minutes to relax. But then suddenly, there was that sound again, which seemed louder that time. A strange rustling sound, like maybe rustling papers, he thought to himself, puzzled. As he sat there and listened hard, he heard it again, and that time he was sure it was coming from inside the house behind him where the victim was. At that point, the deputy admits, he was pretty damned scared. He didn't want to call for backup until he was sure there was someone inside the house, but he also didn't want to go inside the dark, creepy death scene by himself to investigate either. So he stood up and waited once again for any noise, while resting his hand on the gun in his belt. Then, the deputy drew his gun as a loud sound from behind him caused him to spin around and face a large window by the front door, covered by vertical hanging blinds. As he turned around to face the window, an explosion of movement disturbed the vertical blinds. The deputy did admit to me in the telling of this story that he did in fact definitely jump and scream, as most anyone would. The deputy's vision quickly cleared, and he stared at the face on the other side of the window, definitely not expecting to see that particular face staring back at him. The deputy screamed and went wide-eyed. The face staring back at him made a startled sound with wide eyes as well. Then, for a quiet moment, man and feline eyed each other before both turning away, feeling stupid. I guess the suicide victim had a pet cat, which ended up most likely going to a relative of the victim's. The deputy admitted to me after telling me this story that he felt that that was one of the most scariest instances he'd ever had in his whole career. We are not alone at sea. 
from Sea Snake. My name is John. I work aboard a small shipping vessel off the coast of Maine. We catch lobster, fish, and crabs most of the fishing season and get paid pretty well for it. I have been a fisherman for the past 20 years and have seen almost everything that can happen to a person on the big blue sea, from being dragged underwater by the pods we use to catch things in, to limbs being torn off, while caught in the ropes we tend to have strung everywhere. A few months ago, we were looking for snow crabs, a rarity in our area, but they were reported just past the area we usually find ourselves in. It was night. The moon was just starting to wane down from being full, and the tide was quite higher than usual, so the waves were choppy. It's usually not an issue for my crew and me. We tend to get larger catches in these conditions because the waves force them from the bottom of the ocean where they usually rest. We captured several pods that day, so rolling into the night, we had high hopes for a large bounty. It's not often we see hauls like what we were getting, and I was honestly excited. We were on the boat for a few hours at that point, and the weather was starting to look a bit tougher than usual. The clouds were rolling in and blocking the stars. We were several miles away from shore, and getting back would easily take two hours. We would be drenched with rain and swells long before then. We took on waves that would have downed a normal boat, and continued to get the few traps we could find, as others had drifted far from where we had dropped them. The sky was dark, except for the flashes of light coming from the lightning. The world seemed chaotic. The wind howled, and the seas tossed us about without much mercy. I was thankful we were as experienced as we were, or we would have been in a lot of trouble that night. I had honestly thought we were going to go down, but we started back towards shore. But in the lightning, I swore I saw a massive shadow amidst the waves just underneath us, I panicked, signaling to the second mate what I had seen, and he went pale, giving a solemn nod as to indicate he had seen it in the swells as well. He whispered that the captain had seen it, announced it to him and the first mate, and that we were going to steer course to ensure we didn't run into its main body. It was massive, easily dwarfing our boat. I hadn't seen any definite features, but it was absolutely gigantic. We made it to shore without much issue. The captain wrote it off as a giant squid, but those aren't found in these waters, nor do they get so big. I don't know what we saw, but I can absolutely say I hope to never see it again. The Man From Expert 333 Hey, have you ever had one of those nights that just doesn't seem real? Like you're not sure if you're dreaming, or if the universe is just playing some twisted joke on you. Well, I had one of those nights a few months back, and I swear I'll never forget it. I was working the night shift at this 24-hour gas station. You know, one of those old places right off the middle of nowhere part of a highway, right next to the woods. It was around 3am. I was just trying to stay awake at that point hoping my shift would end without any trouble. It was a slow night. I hadn't seen a customer in hours. Suddenly, the lights in the building began to flicker, and the security cameras went all haywire before shutting off completely. I checked the breakers, but I couldn't get the cameras back online. I figured it was some kind of glitch. I would have to call someone to fix it in the morning. About an hour after that, this guy walks in. He looked a bit off. His clothes were dirty and disheveled, like he'd been wandering around the forest for days. But that wasn't the weirdest part. The weirdest part was his face. He had this big smile plastered on his face. But it was odd, like it was stuck that way. And his eyes, man, they didn't blink once during this whole story. I'm not kidding you, not even once. He walked up to the counter, and I got a closer look at him. His skin was pale, almost translucent, and there were dark circles under his eyes. It looked like he hadn't slept in weeks. Can I get a pack of cigarettes? He asked, his voice flat and emotionless. 
I nodded, trying to keep my cool. Uh, sure. Uh, which brand? He pointed to a pack of Marlboros, and I rang him up. As I was getting his change, he just stared at me, that creepy smile never wavering. You know, they're out there, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. I frowned, not sure what he was talking about. Uh, excuse me? Uh, who's out there? He leaned in closer, and I could smell the stale cigarette smoke on his breath. The ones in the woods, they're watching us, always watching. I felt a chill run down my spine, but I tried to laugh it off. Right, okay, uh, here's your change. But he didn't take it. He just kept staring at me with those unblinking eyes. You'll see, they'll come here for you, just like they came for me. And with that, having not blinked nor changed his expression in any way whatsoever, he turned and walked out of the store, his change still in my outstretched hand. I watched him cross the road, heading straight into the woods, disappearing into the darkness. I stood there for a moment, trying to process what had just happened. I'd had my fair share of weird customers, but this guy, he was on a whole other level. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something seriously wrong with him, like he was not entirely human. I looked down at the change he'd left on the counter. That's when I noticed it. The $20 bill he'd paid with looked old and faded, like it had been printed decades ago. Unfortunately, I couldn't make out the year. However, there in the corner of the bill was a symbol I'd never seen before. It looked like an eye, but not quite. More like a spiral, with a single dot in the center. I picked up the bill and held it closer, trying to make sense of it. But the longer I looked at it, the more unsettled I felt. It was like the symbol was staring back at me, boring into my soul. I shoved the bill into the register, trying to push the whole thing out of my mind. But I couldn't help but glance at the woods every few minutes, half expecting to see the guy emerge from the trees, that eerie smile still on his face. A few minutes afterwards, the lights started acting up again, flickering like mad. After a bit, they went back to normal. I tried to shake off the weird feeling, thinking maybe I was just tired, just seeing things. Lo and behold, a little while after that, I saw the guy come out of the woods and head back into the store. He looked even worse than before, like he went out there and rolled around in the dirt. And that smile. It was still there, creepier than ever. I backed away from the counter, trying to put some distance between me and that guy. My heart was pounding in my chest, and my palms were sweaty. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously wrong with the guy. Like, he wasn't entirely human. Hey, man, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Are you okay? Let's take it easy, alright? I don't want any trouble. But he kept coming closer to me, his movements jerky and unnatural. Trouble, he said, his voice barely above a whisper again. Oh, there's no trouble here. Not for me, but for you. He trailed off his smile widening, stretching across his face like a gash. I fumbled for my phone, thinking I could call for help. But when I looked at the screen, there was no signal. It was like this guy was emitting some kind of interference, blocking all the wireless signals in the area. Or maybe I was so freaked out I was reading too much into it. What do you want? I asked, my voice shaking. Money? More cigarettes? Just take what you need and go. He laughed then, a harsh grating sound that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I don't want money. I don't want cigarettes. Something more valuable. He reached out a hand towards me, 
and I saw fingers that were long and spindly, with all too sharp nails. I flinched back, but he was just coming closer, until he was right in front of me. Nothing left of you. Nothing left of you. Nothing left of you. He repeated over and over. I was frozen in terror, unable to move, unable to speak. I could feel this darkness closing in around me, like the shadows themselves were reaching out to grab me. And then the lights flickered off and suddenly came back on. This time, the security cameras whirred back to life, and the guy, he was gone. Vanished into thin air like he had never been there at all. I stood there for a moment, trying to catch my breath. My heart was still racing, and my hands were shaking uncontrollably. I looked around the store, half expecting to see the guy lurking in the shadows, ready to jump out at me. But there was no sign of him. I ran to the door and looked outside, scanning the parking lot for any sign of movement. But there was nothing. Just the sound of crickets chirping in the woods and the distant hum of traffic on the highway. Part of me told me to call the police, report what had happened. But then I thought, what would I say? A creepy man with unblinking eyes and a demonic smile came into my store and just disappeared? They'd think I was crazy. So I just locked the door and tried to finish my shift, jumping at every sound and shadow. When the sun finally came up, and my replacement arrived, I practically ran out of the store, eager to put as much distance between myself and that place as possible. I tried to convince myself it was all just a crazy dream, that maybe I had dozed off during my shift, imagining the whole thing. But deep down, I know it was real. I could still feel the goosebumps on my skin, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something unnatural had happened. Though I had managed to finish my shift, I was a wreck. I couldn't stop replaying the events in my head, trying to make sense of it. The following day, when my boss asked if I could cover another night shift, I told him I couldn't do it. I made up some excuse about having to focus on my studies, but the truth is, I was too scared to go back. I couldn't go through another shift alone at night. Not there. I still drive by that gas station sometimes, and every time I do, I can't help but glance at those woods across the road. I keep thinking I'll see that guy again, his unblinking eyes, his unmoving smile. But so far, I haven't, and honestly, I hope I never do. So yeah, that's my story. I know it sounds crazy, like something out of a horror film, but I swear every word of it is true. And if you ever find yourself working the night shift at a gas station in the middle of nowhere, just be careful. You never know what kind of weird stuff might happen when the rest of the world is sleeping. Dead End from Brian M. At the time this happened, I was working as a cleaner. I hated it. Some people might say I should have been grateful to have a job, any job, but they've probably never had to get up at 5 a.m. six days a week to go and clean the toilets at some office. On that particular day, after cleaning said toilets, it was on to emptying the bins then cleaning the floor. I finished up at the office as the first of the suits were arriving, sipping fancy coffees and tapping away at their latest generation phones. I worked for an agency. They had contracts for cleaning hotels, multiplex cinemas, concert arenas, and hospitals. I could put on a resume that I had experience working with a wider range of crap, not that I would ever write a resume. After all, I had dropped out of school and sleepwalked through a series of soul-destroying jobs. The cleaning job I'm talking about was just the latest. I was almost 30. I was broke. 
living on my own in a disgusting apartment complex, and felt trapped. Anyway, the next morning I was sitting on a bus, trundling away from the city center. It was hideously early. I had dozed off and had a dream where I was being lowered into my grave, holding a mop. I woke up with my face pressed against the bus window and drool on my chin. I yawned and rubbed my eyes, and I saw that the bus had reached the end of the line, a stop across the road from a large, bleak-looking building. It was the first time I had been to this place. My supervisor never told me what goes on there, but as I stood shivering in the cold morning air and looked up at the concrete walls and small windows with steel bars over them, I thought it must have been some kind of secure facility, a prison of some kind or an old asylum. Feeling apprehensive, I followed the sign saying, Visitors this way. These led me inside to a security guard, who printed out a pass and escorted me first to a small room where the cleaning supplies were kept. The corridors he led me along had bare walls and strip lights in the ceilings that buzzed like dozens of trapped flies. Finally, we reached a door that the guard opened by punching numbers into a keypad on the wall. Then he told me to press the buzzer on the intercom inside the room when I was finished. Then he would be able to let me out. I grinned at him nervously and went through the door. It clanged shut behind me, making me jump. I really wished I'd asked if I could use the restroom, which I'd seen in the corridor on the way to the door but was too intimidated to buzz to ask to be let out. So I told myself to hold it in and get busy. I mean, the sooner I finished cleaning, the sooner I could leave. The room I was in was a long, gloomy space. Rows of workstations, each with a desktop computer, chair, and landline, stretched out into the distance. Each of the desks also had a piece of laminated paper propped in a stand next to the phones. I read the shiny piece of paper nearest to me. It seemed to be a script for what to say during a conversation with a customer, who the caller was apparently trying to sell life insurance to. It was clear from the script that the customers were being cold called, and most of the lines were aimed at stopping them from hanging up. I actually felt sorry for the people whose job it was to make phone calls like this, and then had to converse mindlessly using a script. Though maybe I shouldn't feel too bad for them. Maybe they deserved to have such a dreadful job. I remembered listening to a radio show where they were talking about prisoners selling holidays over the phone. The people who were booking their vacations had no idea they were giving their credit card details to murderers and thieves. It could be that the setup I was looking at was very much the same. Not that it made much of a difference to me. I sighed and told myself I needed to stop putting off starting work. I decided to begin by dusting the desks and equipment. They certainly needed it. The cloth I used was coated in gray specks after just a few wipes. And uh, there was a long, dirty fingernail on one of the keyboards. The floor felt sticky underfoot in places as I moved from workstation to workstation. And there was a strange smell there. I hadn't noticed it at first, but now that I had, I couldn't block it out. It was something sickly sweet, something disgusting. Whoever was working here had some serious personal hygiene issues. Trying to breathe through my nose, I worked as quickly as I could, even more keen to be done and back out in the open air than before. Then something happened which put a whole new complexion on the day. I was half-heartedly pushing a broom along the floor when I noticed something bright among the grime. I leaned over and picked it up. I gasped, even swore quietly to myself. I was holding a gold tooth. A smile spread across my face as I tucked the tooth into the lapel pocket of my overalls. I finished the rest of the cleaning, double-quick, and pressed the intercom to be let out. The guard buzzed the door open from his office and told me over the intercom to make my own way to the exit, where he would collect my pass. I went to the restroom first, and after I'd washed my hands, I looked in the mirror 
and checked my poker face. I didn't want the guard to think anything unusual was going on, and I made it out with my little treasure still safely hidden in my pocket. The bus back to the city center seemed to take forever, but finally I was back on familiar territory. There was a pawnbroker I knew who paid for goods with no questions asked, and a couple of hours after finding the gold tooth, I was walking down the street with cash in my wallet. In hindsight, I should have used some of the money to buy groceries or pay off one of the many bills I owed. But I did neither of those things. I went into the first bar I saw and got blind drunk. When my alarm shocked me awake at 5 a.m. the next day, the only thing I could remember was walking into the bar. I had no idea how much I'd drank or how I'd gotten home. I dragged myself out of bed. My head throbbed, and I felt very unsteady. I felt worse when I went through my pockets and realized I'd spent most of the windfall I'd gotten from the gold tooth, which meant I could not afford to call in sick to work, losing a day's wages. Feeling very sorry for myself, I staggered out of the apartment and headed for the bus. Every bump in the road on the journey that followed made my headache worse. By the time I was back among the workstations and cleaning up grime, I could have cried. The only thing that kept me going was the faint possibility I might find another valuable object, the proceeds from which I would spend on more booze to get rid of my hangover. I should have known better, though. People like me are rarely, if ever, lucky, and there was no good fortune waiting for me among the dirt. The dirt and the stench. It had been bad enough the morning before, but with a hangover, it was cruel. The room and its equipment cleaned, I pressed the intercom and was buzzed out. I then sprinted for the restroom and made it just in time to be violently sick. My stomach now emptied, and feeling lightheaded, I staggered out of the restroom. Before I could hand in my pass, I heard a noise nearby. I should not still have been there and didn't have the strength for any kind of confrontation, so I retreated back into the restroom and held the door closed. The sound I had heard grew louder on the other side of the door. It was strange, puzzling. Intrigued, I pressed my ear against the door and heard groaning. A lot of groaning. It sounded like dozens of voices out there. It must be the workers going to their desks to do their dead-end jobs, I thought. I could understand them not being happy, but it was unsettling to hear the noise they were making. That wasn't the most disturbing thing, though. The sickly sweet smell which lingered in their workplace drifted in through the gaps in the doorframe. It was foul. A fresh wave of nausea rose up inside me, and I put my hand over my mouth and nose, trying to breathe steadily. It was horrible, but the groaning sounds started to grow quieter. However, the smell lingered, but it wasn't getting any worse. Hopefully, whoever was outside had almost passed. I cracked the door open an inch and peered out to check. I couldn't see anything, so I opened the door a little more, tentatively sticking my head out into the corridor. There they were, the groaning workers, going into the room I'd cleaned. They were escorted by a uniformed guard carrying a baton. Their arms hung limply at their sides, and they shuffled along unsteadily. They wore faded orange jumpsuits, and where the fabric ended, their skin was gray and it had fallen away in patches. I could swear I could see muscles twisting below, and I glimpsed bone. I was horrified, transfixed. The last man was heading for the open door by now. Just before he reached it, something fell from his hand and landed on the ground. He didn't appear to notice and shuffled on into the room. The door closed behind him and the others. It locked with a loud clang. I was alone once more. I could finally leave. But first, there was one more thing to clean up. 
the thing which had fallen from the man's hand. I moved forward, taking a deep breath, and picked up a finger. It was cold and gray and stank of decay. The stump where the finger had broken off from the rest of the hand was rotted through. I swallowed down a fresh wave of bile and focused on the object which had drawn me to retrieve the finger. I removed a silver ring, placing it into my pocket. Then I got the heck out of there. After all, I had a date with a pawnbroker and a bar to prop up. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast Network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com. <laughs>